Good morning and welcome to Moments with Melinda. I'm your host, Melinda Moulton, and my guest today is Joyce Judy. How are you doing, Joyce? I'm doing great, Melinda. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you. Well, thank you for being on my show. Let me tell my viewers a little bit about you. Joyce Judy began her career in 1983 as a coordinator of academic services at Community College of Vermont. In 2009, she was appointed unanimously by the board to be the president of the college. Her focus is now and always has been to expand access to higher education for all Vermonters. Welcome, Joyce. Thank you for being here. It, it is a delight to join you and be able to talk a little bit about CCV and all that we do for the state of Vermont. Well, I want folks to know too that you and I are good friends, that we go back quite a while in our friendship we get together quite often and um, kibitz about the world. And I've always wanted to interview you for my show. And so this is an exciting moment for me. To begin with, um, I would love it if you could share a bit about your childhood growing up on the McNamara Dairy in Plainfield, New Hampshire. You know, I'd be happy to Melinda. And I, I actually credit my upbringing with being able to do the work that I do today. And, um, and when I say that, I, you know, I grew up on a family farm um, and my, I have, I'm one of um, four, five children. And um, my dad was a quadriplegic and, but always had this dream. He was hurt in an accident. And, um, but my parents always had this dream that they wanted to farm. And, um, and so they bought this rundown farm in Plainfield, New Hampshire, and just slowly started to build it and create something that, um, you know, if they were alive today, they would never imagine that where they started um, buying a house with no electricity and no indoor plumbing and to have it being a thriving enterprise now that my that now um, has three generations that are that are farming. We have a very um, large dairy farm, but we also um, produce and distribute our own milk in glass bottles. We started that long before it was a trend to do recycling in glass bottles. We started it in the very early 90s, we, we circulate our milk under the McNamara Dairy label. Also, I have three nieces and nephews who have come back and they're all farming with my brothers. And we have a very large um, maple um, store, maple industry. Um, so it's been, it's exciting to watch. Um, I try to stay involved a little bit. I um, go down and bother them from time to time, but it's a great perspective for me. and. Why I say that um, growing up on a farm has prepared me for the work that I do today is that you know when we were growing up we had we didn't have much money, um, but we never thought we were poor. And I would say you know managing a community college in some ways is very similar. We never have money, but that doesn't get in our way, um, and we have to be very good stewards of it because eighty percent of CCD's operating budget comes from student tuition. So whatever we do we have to make sure that we are using that tuition money to make sure we are providing the best education that we can for, for Vermonters. And the same way when I was growing up, we, we did so much and we created so much, but it wasn't because we had a lot of resources, but I believe you do your best work when you are forced to be as creative as possible. Well, my next question was going to be, how do you think your experience working your family farm helped prepare you for your job leading the Community College of Vermont? And you answered that. So thank well, you. Well, you know, and I will, I will just expand on that a little bit as well. One of the things, um, you know, I am, I am incredibly proud of my, my upbringing. Um, it's pretty, it was pretty humble. Um, but at the same time, another thing that my dad always taught us is that you do whatever it takes. And so at CCV, you know, we have, we serve 10,000 Vermonters and we have a staff of 150 full-time people and we have 600 part-time faculty. We don't have a lot of staff, but, and so it's do whatever it takes to get the job done. And so, you know, if you're, even though your job description, my job description might be president, but I might be called on to do something else or pick up a piece when someone else is not able to do it. So, in some ways, um, I love this story. We had, a, we had a, a regional director years ago. He's since passed away from cancer. One day he was walking in and he was picking up cigarette butts and a person walked by and said, 
you know, why are you, why are you picking up cigarette butts? You're the regional director. And he looked at him and he said, whatever it takes. And I just sort of feel like that is such an important part of my upbringing, but also such an important part of the culture at CCD. So I wanted to ask you, who, who, who do you believe has had the greatest impact on your tremendous su success as an education you, leader? You know, I, I feel like I've had so many people that have influenced me. Melinda, you've influenced me. I, I cherish my friends. I cherish the people that I work closely with. I, I feel like my parents, you know, had such a, an, an influence on my upbringing, my siblings. So, you know, I don't, I don't look at one person and say, oh, that person has really, has really um, been my mentor. I have had many mentors and I've been so fortunate to have so many people sort of guide me, make suggestions. Um, it's been, um, I've had a wonderful ride. You talk about your dad a lot. Did he have a, a, large, a big influence on your life? Both of my parents. My parents were an incredible team. And I often think of them as, as a team because my dad was a quadriplegic. And yet um, I grew up thinking that he, didn't have, that he didn't have a disability. I mean, my father couldn't walk. He couldn't use his hands in a way that, um, you know, we can't. I mean, he wasn't completely paralyzed from the neck down, but he essentially was paralyzed from the neck down for all practical purposes. And yet he never was the center of, he never wanted attention. And my parents were a team. They just did things together. And, you know, they were together. My dad died in um, 2004 and my mom lived um, till 2020. But they were, they were just a pair. Um, they were a force. My mother had to provide all the bodily functions for my dad. And yet they, they were so independent and so strong-willed and had their own sort of paths as well. So I feel like um, both of my parents had, a, had an influence on me. My mom was a nurse um, and she worked out, but she also um, played a very big role in the farm. And so um, that teamwork was pretty unique and pretty interesting. And I often think about my mom because my dad was hurt um, in an accident. And so their lives changed overnight. And I often think, you know, what did my mom think about that? Because my dad was in the hospital for a very, you know, for many, many months. And, um, you know, at first they didn't think he would live. And, but they never looked back. They always looked forward. Like, what are the opportunities in it? What are, and never thought about what was me. And that's been something that has um, really stayed with me for a long time. Well, it explains who you are in a very big way. Tell us a little bit about the Community College of Vermont, which I believe is the largest college in Vermont. We are not the largest. We are the second largest the college second in largest. Vermont, second only to the University of Vermont. Um, but we also, uh, we serve more Vermonters than any um, college in Vermont. And you can imagine that because we have 12 locations throughout the state of Vermont, we also have a very significant online and remote presence. We have, we um, were formed in 1970. Um, so we're 52 years old. Um, we celebrated our 50th anniversary during COVID. And if someone had ever said to me, oh, you're gonna celebrate your 50th year um, by having your centers essentially closed. I would have said, what planet are you on? But it's the reality and it's what happened. Um, but you know, CCV was created um, through the vision of Governor Dean Davis in the late 60s, early 70s. And his, his vision was, how do you take and provide Vermonters um, a college the opportunity to achieve a college education and do it, taking it to them in their local communities? And he always believed that Vermont communities were incredibly rich with expertise. And how do you take that expertise and marry it with people who are very motivated to learn. And, you know, we have stuck to that core for years. Vermont has incredibly gifted, a gifted population. And there are many people who are, you know, full-time accountants, they're doctors, they're uh, people who work in a manufacturing that won't give up their quote unquote day job, but would love to teach and share their expertise. And so we have some of the most 
our faculty are incredibly rich and incredibly strong. Our students always tell us that one of the best things about CCV is the practical knowledge that our faculty bring to the classroom because they they live it. We have you know doctors who teach anatomy and physiology. We have computer people from from Global Foundries that are teaching our computer courses. We could never afford to hire them full time, but they are so incredibly um, skilled and would love to share that expertise. And then you put it with people who are highly motivated to learn. Um, our average age is 26. And yet one of the things that has, we've seen a shift in our population over the years, for many years, we served almost exclusively adults. And when I say adults, in that context, I mean people like over 25. Today, we are seeing almost half of our population are more traditional age because people find that they can come to CCV, they can save a lot of money, they can do their essentially their first two years with us and then transfer wherever. So we have developed articulation agreements and guided pathways with every school in Vermont and most outside of Vermont so that students can start with us if it's for whatever reasons and then transfer. Um, we are the largest um, transfer cohort of students at UVM and UVM does a regular um, transfer study and finds that CCV students are their most successful transfer cohort, and they do incredibly well. So people come to us for lots of different reasons. Um, you know, we serve a lot of veterans. Every year we have about, every semester, we probably have a couple hundred military or military connected students. We serve many people with disabilities. We serve many new Americans. We, but what's wonderful is when people get into a classroom, it's the leveling. It's they're all there to learn. And so it makes an incredibly rich class because you might have a 16 year old and you might have a 70 year old, but they're all there. This past year at graduation, our youngest was 17, our oldest was 71. Wow. So just that sort of well, mixture. The, the school, the college is also accessible and it's affordable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We work hard to, well, first we do make it as accessible as we can. As I mentioned, we have 12 locations, physical locations. But we also have a very robust online program. We started our online program in 1996, hmm. long before, you know, people, but we believe we started an online program because of access. A cornerstone of our mission is access. And so how do we keep figuring out ways to make a college education accessible to all, all, all Vermonters? And so online was one of those things that reduced travel it reduced time when you're in a really rural environment. Now, you know, broadband is a challenge for some. It's getting better, um, but people can also find their way to a library. Many, there are many hotspots in most um, local communities. But so offering online, when COVID hit in 2020, 40% of our classes were already online. And so switching that other 60%, it was a heavy lift. Don't, don't get me wrong, we, you know, moving those other 60%. But we had a infrastructure in place to be able to do it, which was such an advantage over so many schools who hadn't moved to, to that um, as an option. It's amazing. Can you share with us a few stories about people who have graduated from CCV and how the college impacted their lives? You know, Melinda, it, you asked that's such a wonderful question because, you know, sometimes when I'm talking with groups, I will say to them, you know, CCV's work is about life, it is life changing for so many students. And for us, I think that um, it is. And if we weren't where we were and being able to offer the opportunities to students, so many of them wouldn't have the opportunity to um, see the, experience the power of education and see that education can open so many doors. And, um, you know, it's hard to talk with people around the state and for more than a couple minutes and not find some connection to, um, to CCV, whether they took a course, whether they are teaching a course, whether their grandchild took a course or whatever. I'll share a quick story that was, um, um, so we are offering um, an early college program, which is wonderful um, with, we have, we have tremendous philanthropic support and it's not from necessarily from our alumni, it's from people who believe in our mission and believe in supporting it. So we have a great relationship with the McClure Foundation. 
And they have, they have created this opportunity called the Early College Promise, which is um, if a student does an early college program, meaning they take their, their, during their senior year, they opt to take college courses at CCB. They can still, they stay, they can still participate in high school sports and choir and band and drama and all that, but they take their academic courses for whatever reasons at CCB. The McClure Foundation will support them to, to do their second year at CCB and get their associate degree. And so we were having an early college orientation. I was talking to this um, young woman and I said, so uh, why are you coming to, why are you enrolled in the early college program? And she was there with her mom. And she said, you know, I just, I, I, high school is just, it's really hard for me. The social scene is really hard. You can imagine it. It's, it's tough for some students. And so she said, I just wanted to have a, a clean break. But her mom said, we decided that CCB would, this would be a great option if she wanted to do this. Because my husband um, in 2000 came to CCB and got his degree and is now working full-time for the state in IT. And she said, and his mother had taken courses at CCB. So it's just, you know, it's just a very interesting thing. These are probably, you know, 10, 20 years apart. But how the progression, and they, you know, they all had done well in their education. We see, you know, there's a lot of high profile people. I mean, Dylan G. and Batista, who was a legislator who's just actually championing our, our um, life gap uh, program. Dylan was a legislator. He's someone that dropped out of high school. Um, he uh, came back to CCB, finished his high school degree, got his well, got took courses towards that, finished his college degree, has gone on, was a legislator, um, and, you know, and now has a very successful career. But he attributes CCV as the place where, you know, he was, he was, he was struggling. He came back, he got his education, and now, you know, he's been incredibly successful. So there are just stories after stories after stories of, of people who have come to, come to CCV have found their way. Um, and then, you know, one of our goals is to make sure we prepare students for their next step, whatever that next step is. It might be um, they've come here, they want, they're running their own business, but they need a bookkeeping course. They might come here and get a degree and um, whatever in medical assisting. Or they might come here and take their first 60 credits and transfer to UVM, go on and get their bachelor's degree, get their master's degree, whatever. We have students in that whole spectrum. And our role is to just prepare students for that individual student. What is your next step? Amazing. Um, you began your career at CCV in 1983. And you basically grew up with this college and you must have had your fingers in a lot of pies to help this college become what it is today. Um, so I wanna commend you on that. And do you wanna talk a little bit about that, about being there for your entire career and watching this and helping to grow this college to be what it is today and ending up as the president of CCV? Well, you know, one of the things that's been very interesting about CCV, yes, I have grown up with CCV. I have had the luxury of growing up with CCV. And, um, and CCV has, you know, if you, when we reflect back on, we did during our 50th anniversary, we did this reflection of, you know, each, looking at each of the decades. And um, it's been very fun to see how we have evolved. And so, you know, in the 70s and 80s, you know, people thought of CCV as a sort of fly by night institution and like a little sketchy. And, you know, were they really, what were they doing in these church basements? And, you know, um, we would we were running courses anywhere we could find a space. And um, and it was interesting because, you know, we went from the vision of Dean Davis and then Peter Smith came and really helped to create CCV. But many of the public, the higher ed institutions in Vermont thought we would soon go away. We were sort of the people's express of the, <laughs> the higher ed industry and that, you know, we we weren't really for real. And um, and there were and we were a single line item in the state budget, so that was hugely problematic because you know with the swipe of a pen we could be like gone, 
And so that's when CCD joined the Vermont State College system. And that gave us some stability. And I would say that, you know, in the 80s, we were primarily a college that served women and oftentimes um, people um, who were very low income. But we were providing an opportunity for, for that group of people to really um, change their lives. Mm -hmm. And then in the 90s, as we started to see more and more students, and what was interesting is we were seeing our students go on to other institutions or go to work and be really successful. And people were like, oh, maybe they are doing good work. And so over time, you know, we started to see more and more men. We started developing um, articulation rooms with other colleges because so many of our students wanted to go on. We got really serious about our, the academic quality. And so a lot of things happened in the 1990s that were really foundational to the success of the college. And one of the things that we, we also, um, you know, over time, for a while, we could fly under the radar and we just, you know, we did our own thing. And then as time um, evolved and our students would go on to other schools and other programs, that we had to find the right balance between being a maverick and being able to play by traditional rules. And we, and our work, I believe that we have always kept students at the center of our decision-making. And by doing that, I, we've had to find a way of what serves students best. And so there are times when we've had to adjust our, our, um, policies and procedures and processes to be more traditional because that's what serves students best. Like for example, we, we were a pass no pass institution for the first 25 years of our existence. So if you took a course, you got a P or you got an N. We didn't have grades. But then as students started to transfer, it was harder and harder for them to transfer because traditional schools were like, no, we want you to have letter grades. And so students were saying, no, we wanna have letter grades. We made the transition. From, because you know we were a product of the 60s and we were created and so learning for learning's sake and you know this is all great but you know as our students evolved they were like no we want grades so we we responded by doing letter grades and you know we and the rest is history around the number of students who are transferring but so we've had to you know that's just an example of how nope that wasn't serving students well even though you know we we are we do believe that, you know, learning is really at the core of this, but grades were important as students transferred. So you've grown and you've evolved. Now, I only have yeah. six minutes left of this interview, and I got to tell you, I could talk to you for hours. <laughs> Joyce Judy, <laughs> president of CCV. So often we hear about American children not meeting the international standards of education. Although Vermont rates higher than most states, where do we fail our students and where do we succeed? That's a really, really important question and something to ponder. You know, I'm not, I don't know that we fail our students. I think that one of the things that, um, you know, I believe there's a time and a place. Like for example, I, you know, I'll sort of pivot from that in terms of, you know, how do we make sure that we are there for students when they're ready to learn? And um, so we have a number of students who come to us that didn't do well in high school. Mm -hmm. But when they're highly motivated and they come to us with a real purpose, it's amazing how fast they can make up that time and make up for that loss. And so for us, we offer a lot of, a number of developmental skills courses, which are not considered college level. They don't get college credit for it, but it's what they need. I believe our role is to meet students where they're at. And so I feel like, um, you know, with the, public K-12 system, one of the things that we have laid on that system is we are expecting them to be an educational institution. We are expecting them to be a social service agency. We are expecting so many things. And, you know, it's tough to meet all those. And um, yet I believe that I think a really good teacher figures out how to engage the student where they're at and help them um, create and develop their passion. But it's hard when you have all these other expectations and, you know, how do we make sure we're taking care of, you know, the basic, you know, we are seeing one of the things that we've had to stretch and grow is that, you know, for a long time, we didn't necessarily deal with a lot of the um, 
you know, food insecurity, housing insecurity. And we have had to step up our game because, you know, if you look at the, um, you know, the needs of students in order for them to be a good student and be able to focus, they've got to have their basic needs met. And so how do we connect and partner with um, local agencies to make sure students are getting those needs met? So I don't know that we fail. It's just that we at, at CCV, we have to figure out, we have to meet them where they're at when they come to us. Well, I also think teachers aren't getting paid enough. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think we need to pay our teachers more money uh, for, for, for the great work that they do. And what you just said sort of segues into my final question for you, um, Joyce. Um, what would you tell our youth today that would give them hope for the future in a world where economic inequality, human injustice, and world peace and stability and climate change are their realities? How do they maneuver life as they face the second quarter of the 21st century? Well, I'm always a believer, follow your passion. If you are if you are passionate about something, you just never know the opportunities that will open up and stay open to those opportunities. Um, you know, it's always fun for me to see someone who is really passionate about something. I don't care what they're passionate about. Be passionate about something and you can create so much from that. Um, and so, I, you know, I am full of hope. I'm an, I'm an optimistic person. Yeah, we have a lot of challenges in front of us. You know, there are things I can get really down on. But in the end, we we do have some, we have control over our own sphere. And so how do we take control of that and do the very best we can with what we can control? Well, Joyce, Judy, you are one of the most passionate women I know. And um, you're passionate about your running. You're passionate about your, your educational work. Um, and I, and I just adore you for that. And thank you so much for this time, um, to my viewers. I, you know, I, I hope that you'll go on to the website, um, community college of Vermont and, uh, visit their website. It's a great website and, uh, learn about their services and their, their, uh, and what they provide students in Vermont. So, so Joyce, um, Thank you for being here today. Is there anything you want to share with my viewers before we say goodbye? No, I would just say thank you. And, you know, it's such a privilege to be able to, to spend some time with you and also to serve as president of CCV. I work with incredibly amazing people, both faculty and staff. It's why I can do my work. And so, you know, our success is really um, about the work that our faculty and staff do with students. And I think a lot of the success of Vermont is from the students who have come out of, out of the CCV program too, because they're serving our economy and they're out there doing the work and they're part of our economic growth. And so for that, um, thank you for all you've done over the years, the many, many years that you've serviced this organization. And to my viewers, thank you for joining us and being here with Joyce Judy, the president of Community College of Vermont. And I'm going to say goodbye. But to you, Joyce, I'm going to ask you to stay on so I can talk to you. And to all of you, I want you to have a beautiful day and I'll see you soon.